Yeah, b both uh, Dr. Maddox and Dr. Battaglia work here with uh, with me at Logan University. Um, Ross took over uh, the Myrtle Hilliard Davis Comprehensive Health Center chiropractic service. Uh, uh, Myrtle Hilliard is a FQHC in St. Louis, a, a system actually. And he took over uh, a clinic I started back in 2015. He's been running that clinic since October of 2015. Uh, Pat Battaglia has taken over the reins of a similar clinic in a different FQHC system known as Affinia. Uh, and, he, and he started that, uh, started working in that clinic in July of last year. Uh, they both have uh, a lot of experience in um, uh, the field of imaging. They went through a radiology residency here at the school and uh, ultrasound or advanced imaging fellowship and, uh, and then have done a pretty darn good job of taking over care in these clinics. And, and I've asked them to share uh, their experiences, both good and bad, with the group uh, because there's a lot of, uh, of uh, similarities uh, in terms of establishing integrative systems uh, independent of the, of the profession that, that will translate into other people's worlds. So I thought that might be helpful for you here. So here they are. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm Pat Pataglia, by the way. Ross Maddox. Ross, you're the elder guess, uh, statesman here. Why don't I let you uh, lead the show, and I'll just piggyback yeah, on what you sure. said. Uh, Beth, you have control of the screen, correct? That's right. Okay, so you can go on uh, to our first slide, I think, uh, which just has an overview of things that we're going to talk about. Uh, so everyone can see the discussion points and a uh, we have very few slides, and each each slide we're just going to uh, kind of, I, I guess, talk about each of the topics. And if anybody has any questions, obviously chime in, or if you guys want to hold them for the end, like we talked about before, uh, either way I think works for us. So we can go on to the first slide. So and on that slide we're going to be talking about. Uh, yes, discussion can points, we can stay on this one? Uh, nope, you can go to the next slide which is uh, just the first discussion point. So yeah, uh, <clears throat> the acceptance of, of us, and we're going to be talking specifically about chiropractic care because we are chiropractors. <clears throat> as far as, uh, and I'll speak for myself, Pat is in a different FQHC. Uh, the FQHC that I'm in, I think we've been select, uh, accepted by the organization very well. Uh, we've been well received. We get lots of referrals from a variety of different providers. Uh, in my facility specifically, we have uh, uh, internists, uh, we have podiatry, we have dental, we have women's health, uh, and we get referrals from really all of those uh, different providers. Um, for, now, from the provider standpoint, the thing that I run into a lot is the providers don't always know what it is that we do as chiropractors. Now, they might send us patients, but oftentimes, I, I can speak personally, I get patients who really don't belong with the chiropractor, yet they're referred to me, and then I'm left to try to figure out where to send them from there. Uh, and I also am aware of other patients with symptoms that we could easily treat, uh, and they get sent elsewhere. They're, they're not referred to the chiropractor. So uh, I, I know we need to do a better job of, of making people aware. And I think it's just the general public as well. A lot of people simply don't know what it is that, we're, that we do and what we can help with. Um, and then uh, from my end, the patients, patient part of it, patients love us, uh, patients come all the time and patients uh, really, we don't advertise at all, patients do the advertising, they tell, tell their friends and they tell the doctors and then that's really where our referrals come from. So uh, Pat may have some different experiences that he can speak on. Uh, yeah, for the most part, you know, I'll, I'll echo a lot of that. The patient uh, satisfaction uh, seems to be high. Um, patients like having uh, this type of provider here, someone who does uh, the type of therapy that we do um, to manage their complaints. Uh, mm -hmm. At the organizational level, uh, administration in particular, uh, we're very well uh, received. Um, we've been expanding within our particular um, system. So I think they want us here. They like having us here. We're a nice outlet for a number of their spinal and extremity cases. Uh, the providers, like Ross mentioned, uh, we still struggle with awareness and making providers aware of what we do and 
and what we don't do. And certainly, um, we could continually do a better job to attract the type of cases that we can help with and that we can help a lot with and to deter some cases that would be better served um, with other forms of pain management, whether it's just purely something like uh, behavior health or even um, other medical uh, medical forms like uh, orthopedists, for example. Uh, so for the most part, the administration and the patients, um, they're happy we're there. Uh, they like what we have to offer. Providers, once they get to know us, uh, they echo those statements, but we could continually do a better job with uh, provider awareness. And that's, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say on uh, on that point. Yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. So uh, Pat and I do have uh, different issues here. Uh, since we're in different FQHCs, we have uh, a different fee structure. So for myself, patients can come in and see us for free, uh, except for Medicare. We have to bill Medicare, but besides that, uh, patients pay nothing to see us, whereas where Pat is, they have a $10 copay, uh, or a, not a copay, but a $10 per visit pay. So, uh, Pat, if you want to start, I think we are going to have different experiences here. Yeah, uh, definitely. Like uh, similar to Ross's patients, a number of our patients are at or below the poverty line, and they're uninsured or underinsured. So, mm -hmm. considering that patient demographic, when you institute um, a fee for every visit, uh, certainly that's a big barrier, especially a $10 fee. Um, most providers here have fees upwards of $20, if not more, but we have to keep in mind that a primary care doctor may see their patient two to three times a year. If we see a new patient for low back pain, we'd like to have a few visits uh, in a short period of time. So that is a barrier when you have to consider having a conversation with someone up front who is at or below the poverty line that we're talking $30, $40 um, worth of care within a couple week time frame. So we try to modify uh, what we do with patients in a number of ways from taking longer with the patient, uh, making sure we establish a good diagnosis, making sure we can reassure them in a number of cases there's nothing really wrong, and then taking time to do uh, a lot of self-care management strategy, accepting the fact that we might not get to complete a full treatment plan on a number of patients. So. That cost barrier um, is definitely the biggest issue that we have, I think, related to continued compliance and uh, no-shows from our patients. It's not uncommon for me to have a new patient show up at the front desk for registration only to find out there's an additional fee and then decline you know, therapy for that day, decline to be seen for that day. And for myself, uh, even though we don't have a fee for that patient to see us, there are maybe other costs or barriers associated uh, that may keep that patient from getting to us. So like Dr. Battaglia said, if somebody's at or below, sometimes far below the poverty level, unemployed for years, food stamps and all that, a $2 bus ride is sometimes a big deal. Uh, scraping together two bucks for the bus is sometimes a big deal. Not everybody, a lot of our patients live in this neighborhood, but not certainly not all of them. So. Sometimes people are traveling great distances. A lot of times people don't have their own cars. They may rely on somebody else for a ride or the bus. And again, if the bus is, is their transportation, then uh, a couple bucks to get here is a big deal. Um, other barriers, you know, for patients who do work, oftentimes patients work during our scheduled hours and they're not available to come while we're open. Uh, and then another one that happens every once in a while, it's unfortunate, Obviously, we want what's best for the patient, and we want them to get to the provider who's going to provide the best care. Sometimes a patient might be referred by a PCP outside of here, and then that provider, that specialist might say, oh, don't go see a chiropractor. Well, they may not realize that that person was seeing us and they were getting better. And a lot of times I hear that from the patient. They'll come back and say, well, I went to this specialist, whatever profession they're in, and they said that I shouldn't see you anymore. So occasionally that happens too, and that becomes a problem with compliance because then the patient's confused. Well, I was getting better, but somebody else told me not to see you anymore. So yeah, if I can interrupt really you, Ross, that even yeah. happens uh, individually at the provider level. Internally, you'll see a patient a few times, and they'll go back to their primary who had already initiated um, a referral, you know, to orthopedics, for example. Um, 
and we're kind of that stop gap in between. We'll go see chiropractic until this referral comes through. We'll start getting results. But then once the referral comes in, that's it. They just shut down that other aspect of the care. It's like we're just a step on the ladder um, sometimes, as opposed to uh, probably the way it should be as well. Let's give this uh, a, a good effort. And if it doesn't work, then we'll consider starting this referral. It's uh, everything happens at once from a referral standpoint. Um, and we're just part of that process. So that, that affects compliance as well, um, internally similar to what you were saying. And I think uh, with that being said, we can go on to the next slide. So uh, for me, and I think uh, a lot of this is going to be the same for Dr. Battaglia, uh, the primary motivation that I see are people wanting to get out of pain. People come in and they say, you know, I've been taking the medications, I've been taking whatever pain relievers, whether they're opioids or not, and not only do I like not like the way they make me feel, but I, I can't function as well, and I don't want to be taking them, and oftentimes they're just not working anyway, so I think we all know that people continue to take stuff when it's not working, um, and patients are reporting to us that they want to regain whatever it is <clears throat> that they perceive that they've lost, and sometimes that's a a physical movement, I can't raise my shoulder or I can't bend over to tie my shoes. And sometimes it's a social or emotional uh, aspect. You know, I'm, I'm depressed, I'm not as happy as I used to be. I want to go to the movies again. I want to go out dancing again. Uh, I want to be able to function at my job better. So, uh, you know, we get the occasional, and this is very rare, where we do get somebody who just doesn't know what it is that, that we do, and they come in and they say, well, I'm here to get my pain medication refilled. You know, they're, they're, they're going to different doctors because their doctor has cut them off. But I'll say that that's rare. Most of the people who are seeing us are, are really out to get better. And, and, you know, obviously we want to find out their goals and try to help them achieve those. Yeah, no doubt there are the odd pill seeker out there. But it's, you know, I agree with our experience too. It's very rare. And even then, some of the patients, uh, that's all they know for pain management is medication. So. I don't fully fault them for coming in, sitting down, and asking for medication because that's really the only avenue they've had for pain management um, since they started experiencing, you know, whatever the pain is. So uh, I would agree it's very rare in our site to have a true uh, pill seeker coming in and trying to play us just to get medication. And obviously they're disappointed at the end of the visit when they realize we don't have any prescriptive rights. Um, but for the most part, yeah, patients, they don't like the way they feel from pain medication makes them foggy, makes them function, um, it reduces their function. So definitely that's uh, by far our biggest motivation as well. Yeah, and uh, at, at my site at least, uh, besides behavioral health, what Dr. Battaglia said, you know, all they know might be pain medicine from a pain management standpoint. Besides behavioral health, once chiropractic got involved here, that was the first step of really the only non-pharmacologic approach at the site you know otherwise it's go to behavioral health and then we're going to refer you on to a specialist which may be you know advanced pain management uh, orthopedics or whatever so offering some form of manual therapy has just been huge and uh, I think, again well received by patient and administration <clears throat> and uh, I think we can go on to the next slide Uh, Pat, you want to start? Uh, yeah, so patient satisfaction, uh, again, I think we both agree it, it's positive, and that's for a number of reasons. Uh, we have longer appointment times, and I think we have, uh, we're very vested in the care uh, of our patients, so uh, we take a lot of time, face time with them, getting to know them, and that goes a long way, especially in, in the chronic pain patient. Um, and then what we do, you know, putting your hands on someone, doing manual therapy establishes a rapport and, and can provide relief. Um, other things not on here, we take the time to modify their daily activities, finding ways to do things more comfortable that they can get by uh, with less discomfort. And all of that uh, is very well received by the patient. Um, from a negative standpoint, a couple things. Uh, we are both in teaching environments, uh, and every student, of course, has a different skill set um, that they come in with. So the care is not standardized in the sense we're not the ones administering care on every patient. We're overseeing it on every patient, but directly administering it, it's a little bit different. Uh, and some patients don't tolerate the treatment from particular students. But uh, for the most part, 
that's rare. Um, any sort of therapy most patient gets, uh, most patients get, is is well received, I would say. But the teaching environment does have that, um, I say, very small drawback to it when we consider overall patient satisfaction. Yeah, I, I think that the time aspect is huge for me. Uh, being able to spend more time with the patient is is just really valuable. And uh, you know, maybe I'm speaking for other doctors in general, but I would think that every doctor out there, regardless of their specialty, wishes that they could spend more time with the patient. Often they feel rushed and they don't really get to the bottom of things, and that's really not the best uh, care for the patient. Uh, we get to develop a level of trust by spending time with the patients. And a lot of times, I'm in the EHR and I can see notes from other providers. A lot of times we're getting new information that wasn't revealed to other pro providers. And I think that's coming as a result of being able to spend a little extra time, being able to dig, being able to form that trust and uh, get more information from the patient. I think in many ways, our visits act as much of a, a therapeutic visit on a behavioral health level as much as they do on a physical level of the manual therapy and just you know sometimes that might be the only interaction that a patient has on that day with another human being uh, and somebody listening to their problems and addressing their problems and making their problems real versus you know they might be blown off if somebody's in a hurry that makes a, a big big deal to the patient and uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'll speak for my site first. Uh, we do have fee differences. Again, it's free for a patient to come see me versus uh, it's not at Dr. Battaglia's site. Because it's free, that has good and bad things associated with it. The good thing is people can get in for the care that they need. That's great because money is no longer a barrier. Uh, the bad part is when you go for those of you who do go to a chiropractor and, and, and it feels good, wouldn't you go all the time if it was free? And we get some people who do that, unfortunately. It's free. It makes me feel good. I'm going to do it three times a week. Uh, and we do our best to prevent that, but with other staff, sometimes that scheduling is out of our hands and we end up seeing people too much. Well, unfortunately, those people are taking appointment spots from people who really need it. Um, other consequences are people make the appointments because there are no consequences to miss the appointment, they end up no-showing. And again, they're taking that spot away from somebody who may have needed it. Um, and as far as direct access versus referral, at Dr. Vitegli will speak on his site. Uh, at my site, they don't have to be referred. Somebody can walk right in and see us. So uh, patients might hear about it from a friend and they're not uh, a patient at this clinic, they can walk in and I can be, as the chiropractor, the very first person, very first doctor that sees that person in this clinic. And uh, Dr. Battaglia can speak on what happens at his clinic. Yeah, so we are uh, referral only. Someone uh, has to be seen um, usually by primary care. Sometimes it's uh, some of the other providers, but usually it's primary care and they get a referral to come and see me um, for a particular complaint. And we try to respect um, the wishes from the primary care doctor on that end, because oftentimes when a patient will come into the room, uh, I'll see they're referred for back pain, but they'll start telling me about their shoulder pain and neck pain, and et cetera. So we try to be respectful of the primary wishes for the most part, and then we'll start working with the patient as we go forward. Um, we do get requests from patients you know, off the street, if you will, for care, and uh, having to turn them away is tough, but um, I think if we just uh, continue to do a better job internally with provider education, um, there's still a number of patients that uh, we can help currently that we're not. So direct access would be nice. Um, doesn't exactly speak to an integrated model, though, where uh, really in that point you're just kind of operating as an independent practitioner inside of the building. So the referral component is also nice in that I can see their health chart, and if I have questions or I need an avenue for a primary care doctor to send them to, uh, it is all under one roof, so to speak. So I think there are benefits um, to both. Uh, certainly referral only is a bit more integrated, I think, than direct access, but it'd be nice, of course, to help patients that want to just simply come in uh, for care for you know, back pain, neck pain, what have you. Um, and we discussed the fee differences. The $10 barrier uh, can be 
challenging for some patients to execute a full treatment plan or even patients to consider uh, starting treatment. So um, if I could change one of these two lists, it'd generally be the fee before I would consider changing direct access versus uh, referral. And next slide, please. So primary spine care is something that I've kind of taken on here at, at our location. Uh, my part of it, I'll speak to it in a perfect world. I mean, in a perfect world, a patient comes in, they have pain that seems to be musculoskeletal in origin. Ideally, somebody triages them, uh, whatever that person be, a nurse, whoever does that job and then routes them to the right location. In our site specifically, usually a patient that we're seeing who has uh, musculoskeletal pain, they usually have chronic pain. You know, there's usually a lot more than just that musculoskeletal pain involved. And here in this integrated setting, we're seeing them along with their primary care doctor, along with uh, behavioral health, we're all kind of in the same area. I can look at their notes, they can look at mine. Um, you know. As with any profession, there are some patients who are going to get dramatically better with that kind of treatment. So from our point of view, uh, some patients get dramatically better with a single course of manual therapy and a home exercise uh, uh, program. Uh, maybe that's more than one visit, but what it's doing in those people, our patient population, which is mostly, again, uninsured, underinsured, are chronic users of the emergency room. Uh, when a person can't get into their medical doctor immediately when they have a flare-up of pain, they're going to end up in the ER, and that's a huge driver of cost and a largely inefficient way of treating musculoskeletal-related pain. Uh, there are papers out there on that subject. If you ask uh, emergency room doctors, emergency room staff, who do they not want to treat, it's these people who come back repeatedly with the same problem. It's you know chronic pain stuff uh, that they really don't have the means to treat uh, because they're there for life-saving purposes and that patient really doesn't meet that criteria. However, the integrated setting allows us to much more effectively co-manage chronic pain, again, in the presence of their primary care doctors and their behavioral health uh, consultants as well. Uh, so if, if, if we could just get to those patients early on, you know, they come in, it's they're labeled as low back pain or neck pain. Obviously, we want to rule out any uh, any major pathology, but if that's the case, then like we talked about before, a simple trial of care, manual therapy, adapting some things that they do at home, oftentimes those people are going to get better. Uh, and if they don't, then of course we we refer them and we go along to uh, some more advanced things. Uh, but in doing so, we can really keep a lot of people out of the ER that way. Yeah, our um, I mean, I think that's all good stuff. And just to uh, a bit more, you know, I obviously am biased. I think our profession, our training is um, positioned well to take on this primary spine care role. Uh, one, you know, I think we can establish a diagnosis if needed, especially a serious one. Um, and acknowledging that that's really rare, people who come in with low back pain, a, a serious diagnosis is rare, uh, should make everyone feel more comfortable. Uh, but I still think we have the skill set to establish that. And then the treatment we give is also cost effective, right? It's non drug, it's non surgery. Uh, we don't treat patients, you know, every day, all day. So um, not only are we effective at subtyping patients that we can or can't help, the intervention we're going to do is also very cost effective. So, um, and I think it will go a long way, like Ross mentioned, to establishing, or rather to being uh, more effective with patient care within our environment, um, a fairly qualified health center, and then also uh, eliminating the burden on other health care providers, uh, such as the emergency department. And even uh, the emergency department, for sure, but I can also speak for the the primary care providers at this site. The people they really hate seeing are people with musculoskeletal pain because that's not really their uh, their forte. You know, well, what do I do with a person who's sitting there crying and can't get on my treat on my uh, exam table? Uh, and like Dr. Battaglia said, I'm kind of used to that. That's almost what I expect. Uh, and I'm kind of good at it. That's, that's that's what we do. Yeah, and this, I think it was back a bit. We talked about uh, provider awareness. Um, you know, in an ideal world, uh, even if a primary care doctor has seen their patient for a routine visit or for hypertension or diabetes, if the patient expresses back pain, neck pain, what have you, as long as there's clearly nothing uh, worrisome or urgent, um, 
it would be ideal if that visit, that portion of the visit stopped there and now we were brought into the treatment, okay, you're going to see these spine care experts for evaluation and management of this complaint, as opposed to, which we mentioned before, um, they get treatment advice from their primary doctor, exercise, IT, they get an orthopedic referral, and they get told to come see us. If you're the patient in that scenario, it's very confusing. So having this primary spine care doctor established gives you an easy outlet, like Ross mentioned, for the primary care docs to um, send these patients somewhere else. I believe the next slide has our email addresses. So if you want to spend just a, uh, everybody take a minute. If, if you have any personal, uh, any specific questions for us that don't get mentioned here, uh, these are our email addresses. And obviously we're more than willing to answer any questions that anybody might send our way. And that being said, Beth, I think we are done. Yeah, thank you everyone uh, for your time and attention. Well, thank yeah, you, thank you. so much. This is uh, it's very nice having two people present as well to hear the little bit of back and forth. And I see that we do have a couple of questions. So first, I'll I'll ask if anybody would like to raise their hand or ask a question right now, and then I'll go into the one that that I see on the question log. Diane, did you did you want to mention what you had mentioned in the questions panel? Sure. Um, so, I was wondering, hearing the story, I see this as a great opportunity for a journey mapping research project, like mapping some of the patient's experiences to kind of see where the critical points are of where they might be missing out and or where the greatest um, bright spots are to help other people understand it as well as looking at how it does help the other practitioners, like even asking the other practitioners where it benefits. I don't know if that is something that's available or that you guys would be interested in. Uh, yeah, uh, available. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ross. No, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say available, I don't know. Interested in, absolutely. Uh, anything yeah, that helps patients, then and, and by all means. and. Uh, I think you know there are things that are lacking here for sure. Can can it, can the patients get better care? Absolutely. You know there are some providers who aren't even rep represented under this roof. Um, but I think the more people who knew about it, the more patients who knew about it would be great. And I think you'd hear some pretty dramatic stories, just like you'd hear some you know normal stories in some patients who don't get better. You'll hear some who say, "Well, this is the first time somebody ever." blank, whatever, you know, listened to me or cared for me or first time I've gotten a good night's sleep. There's, there's lots of that stuff out there, uh, probably across uh, lots of professions, not just ours. But yeah, there are some, some wonderful stories to be heard here. Yeah, Dr. Weiss you guys still on. He'd, he'd probably be the guy that could even facilitate that best. Um, yeah. Probably better than yeah, that's what I was wondering. Do you yeah, have you, the capabilities? You, nope. Do you guys have research within Logan? Do we have research within Logan to, I, I'm not sure I understand to like the to, I guess to collaborate because that, that's what I find like, so a lot of times as practitioners, we're not the greatest researchers, but collaborating with, and I'm speaking for myself, um, but collaborating with people that understand the methodology of the research really helps the project um, flow easier versus, you know, if everybody can do what they do best and collaborate around one thing, um, it helps move things forward a lot quicker. And there so are. So I think maybe your question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna, no, go ahead. To clarify. Uh, I think you're. you're what, that's okay. I think what you're. You, you might be asking more about is what kind of resources we have to to accommodate yeah. this, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it, uh, and and I, I think we have a lot of resources, and uh, the benefit of the group that is involved in this presentation right now uh, is that we've got collaborative relationships around the country uh, with uh, with people that have strengths that we might not have here. So I would suggest that you do this. If you can record the email addresses of, of the two guys that you see on the screen in front of you, uh, send them a message. They'll get it to me, and then we'll get the process started. How's that? Sounds great. Thank you. 
We have a couple other questions on the question pane, uh, question panel that uh, some people are unable to uh, get unmuted and ask themselves. So let me ask for, for Jennifer Johnson a couple of questions. The first is, how long are office visits? You mentioned that they're longer than others. At our so site, it's uh, 40 minutes for uh, an existing patient and one hour for a new patient uh, exam. That takes into account um, patients late, their record keeping requirements, that sort of thing. Definitely the same here, and I think that longer patient time uh, might not work in the real world, but in a teaching environment, uh, I think it's almost essential. We used to have uh, patient visits that were half that time. Uh, we were seeing more patients at that time, um, but the students were learning a lot less about them, and I think the, the patients also felt kind of rushed, so I feel like the quality of care that we're able to provide has really increased the more time we have. Um, and again, if that was a money-making experience, then that's not a real-world model that's going to work. Uh, but this is not a money-making model. This is a, a learning environment for the students, and it works really well. Thank you. Uh, Jen Fresa, a couple other questions, but let me, let me turn to Steve Cena, who has raised his hand and, and has a question. So, Steve, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Great, thanks. Um, thanks for your... Uh, talk. That was, that was great. I, my question is about uh, what your schedules are like. Do you carry a didactic load as well as providing clinical supervision, or is the clinical supervision sort of your full-time work? Go ahead, Pat. Um, it's it's full-time. I, I personally do uh, teach one class uh, in the morning before clinic. Our clinic hours are 9 to 4, so uh, I do lecture uh, in the morning uh, for 50 minutes, but uh, the clinic schedule itself is uh, is a full time schedule. I do not have a class that I teach um, uh, in the clinic full time. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks for the question, Steve. I'm turning back to Jennifer Johnson's questions, how are you tracking patient outcomes and cost savings? Excellent question. Uh, for myself, this facility has resources to track cost savings. Uh, myself, I don't know that I'm really able to track that. Now, the, the facility itself tracks, for instance, uh, opioid usage. I know that that is down dramatically since we've been in. I don't know how you track the cost savings from somebody staying out of the ER because you have no way to predict them going to the ER, and that's probably the biggest driver of cost in our chronic pain population. Um, I know they do have numbers out there, though, I'm not exactly sure what they are, uh, of what this system saves, or I'm sorry, what this facility saves the system overall as far as people able to get care in an underserved area. And Pat, you may have more to add on that. Yeah, no, we. Uh, I also don't know exactly how cost saving uh, is being looked at. Um, as far as patient outcomes, we use a standardized questionnaire um, uh, at my site because of the limitation in visit visit number. Uh, we don't always get a chance to readminister the questionnaire after a completion of a trial of care. So that is something missing on the back end from fully quantifying patient outcome. Um, we definitely get more baseline data up front about how the particular condition is affecting the patient with the questionnaire, but then the response to therapy is a little bit muddy, probably more subjective than anything uh, at this point. Yeah, and I guess I probably get uh, more follow-up than Dr. Battaglia does, again, because of the, uh, the fee barrier, uh, and we do see fairly dramatic improvements in not just psychosocial component, but also the functional component on these uh, pain questionnaires, and as well as people simply telling us, I take less pain medication. Sometimes what they mean by that is simply Advil or Aleve, but sometimes that's oxycodone, Percocet, you know, sometimes we're talking about opioids. So those are uh, obviously outcomes that we want to see. Okay, thank you for that. And, and we do have another question here, uh, again from Jennifer, so thanks for all these great questions, Jennifer. Um, what is the follow-up with the referring provider? Do you send notes back or set meetings to discuss care? 
we don't have anything uh, formal that we do. Um, we will reach, or I will anyway, reach out, uh, obviously in cases in which I think there's a diagnosis that um, requires more management. Um, we have started uh, being a bit more formal with sending, we just call them clinical tasks or the internal email with the provider, uh, thanking them for the referral and um, giving them updates. Um, I have to be honest, I don't know how well that's received. I think every provider is different. Some would just as well not get another thing in their inbox. Others like to have it. Um, so it's really, I think, uh, provider dependent who the referrer is uh, that all go out of my way to reach out more or less to, um, depending on who it is. Yeah, similar for me. I, I think the biggest thing for me is just the EHR itself. Uh, everybody in this building and even in the other facilities that aren't at the same geographical site that are associated with the same facility, we all have access to the same EHR. I can read their notes and they can read mine. Uh, so I'm always sure that our notes uh, communicate what we're doing and how the patient's responding so that the other provider can go in and easily look at it. I will say, rather than contact every provider and say, hey, this person's doing better, the most time that I actually reach out to a provider is when somebody's not responding. And that's simply to say, hey, you sent them to me, they're not getting any better, let's talk about what to do next. You know, do they need to go to the ortho, do they need to go to the pain management? Are they receiving behavioral health, uh, uh, you know, management once they're not getting better with our trial of care is probably where I reach out the most. And I will say, but I don't again, know if Dr. Maddox has the same experience. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Nope, go ahead. You're good. I don't know if uh, he got the same experience, but usually if, if that conversation does happen, hey, I think they're not responding, you know, I think they have carpal tunnel, they should see an ortho, what have you, whatever it is, um, if they're not getting better with care. Um, my experience has been the, the primary is really receptive to that conversation in particular, uh, and they usually, if not always, take uh, the advice to heart and will initiate the referral. Um, I don't know if it's because they're just looking for a reason to refer or not, but they do... Uh, I've had nothing but good responses when I have those particular uh, conversations. Yeah, same here. Well, thank you so much. This has been really fun, really enlightening, and also perfect timing because we're we're right at the hour. So uh, the, our our whole group uh, um, joins me in saying that we're very appreciative of your time. Thank you so much for your willingness to to talk with us and.